I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Um, he's indeed a familiar face to many of us, and he's widely credited as a pioneer in public-private partnership. Um, and Tilan Vijay Singh has over 26 years of experience in the field working, uh, working here. Today, we invite him to share a few, sorry, a few words with us all, merging his many years of experience with this pertinent topic of economic freedom. Tilan. Thank you very much. I love short introductions. Uh, former minister, uh, Advocata's CEO, Dharanath, distinguished guests. When I was invited to speak today, obviously I was honored, and I thought of picking a topic that's pertinent to the subject matter being discussed today, and that's attracting FDI freedom to invest. And I thought now I'm old enough, having done this business for 30 years, of promoting investments in this country, both domestic as well as internationally, starting my entrepreneurial career as an investment banker in the early 90s, when I recall just about three weeks after the assassination of President Premadasa, we executed the uh, by-side mandate of Transasia Hotel, Oberoi Hotel, uh, and then subsequently intercontinental to foreign investors. And then subsequently that resulted in my being invited to run the BOI, survived through several bomb blasts, uh, nevertheless, uh, we continue to plug the country and then held an honorary position as chairman of the PPP agency, the first chairman of the newly constituted PPP agency. And today I'm back, the last 12 years being an investment banker, working with, for example, Deloitte India, trying to privatize the Hyatt and Litro Gas. So I've been on both sides of the equation, running private sector corporates, as well as being in government to understand what it means to have freedom to invest. And to start with, first and foremost, we need to have sound macroeconomic management and not be a part yet again of this, what I call the unvirtuous cycle of going back and forth between IMF programs. So therefore, prudent economic management is an absolute sine qua non for investment promotion and attracting investment, and that goes hand in glove with policy consistency. Actually, the central theme for this speech, I thought I'll base on something that popped out of statistics when I was doing an analysis for a previous speech. I noticed that the period between 95 to 2000, it was a six year period, during which time I was a full-time employee of the government as chairman of the BOI, was the longest period Sri Lanka did not go under an IMF pro program. So I thought it might be permanent, per pertinent for me to go into a bit of history uh, because I had the privilege of being a part of a very erudite economic think tank and a team led by Mr. A.S. Jawadana as Secretary to the Treasury and later Governor of the Central Bank and Dr. Lal Jawadana who was economic advisor to the then President and the architect of the economic integration between India and Sri Lanka and uh, also the architect of engineering the Indo-Lanka Free Trade Agreement. So let's look at what went right, because the second part of my speech will look at more recent trends in FDI, and then I'll talk of the future at the end of my speech. Now, yes, the economy during that period grew at about 5.1%, which was higher than the uh, national average. And as you can see in this chart, now we have a situation where the wartime GDP growth rate on average was higher than the peacetime GDP growth rate. And then I thought I'll focus on 1997, when net FDI inflows, which in my view is the correct statistic to look at when we talk about FDI, net FDI inflow as a percentage of GDP reached an all-time high of 2.8% in 1997. Now, this is a number we should be consistently achieving because most some countries do 3, 4, 5% of GDP as, as net FDI inflows. Now, how did that happen? There was things that happened which I will highlight later that actually enhanced the country's freedom to invest. And in particular, I want to highlight the five years between again 1995 and 2000 where we achieved 
an average equity FDI of $150 million. It was actually $155 million to be exact, which is 50% higher than the equity FDI of the post-war Sri Lanka era. Now, why is equity FDI important? Because that's what creates FDI stock in this country. That's where new projects come into the country, and that's through those new projects is where we have retained earnings being reinvested and expansions happening. So there was a greater degree of FDI stock being created prior to the, to, to the conflict than after the conflict. Now, and this is something that I wanted to sort of highlight to Harsha, uh, because one of your, I think, text messages talked of the fact that um, Sri Lanka forgot export promotion after President Premadasa. I'd like to argue and say Sri Lanka forgot export promotion after President Chandrika because in 2000, we achieved the highest ever level, and that was prior to the negative GDP growth in 2001, so it was, the base was the correct base. We achieved the highest ever level of exports as a percentage of GDP of 39%, and it has gone down subsequently to 15.4%, and of course you see a slight spike coming, again because the base is going down due to negative GDP growth. Now, what did we do during that time, 96 to 2001? I'm willing to argue that the quality of wartime FDI, particularly when you consider export orientation, was higher than post-war. Now, in terms of direct and indirect exports, that was a time where textured jersey set up in the Sitawaka zone. YKK of Japan set up a zipper, zipper and button manufacturing facility. They took six months to do their due diligence on Sri Lanka. Lodestar. Sri Lanka's largest rubber export company set up during that time in Midigama. Today it's Michelin. And between Mast Industries, Martin Trust, MAS, Brandix, at least 10 factories with more than $10 million of investment. And by, by the way, the cutoff point for this slide is more than $10 million being invested were set up during that, that time, all of which were export oriented. Let's look at services. I remember taking Adrian Zaka. I didn't know who he was, the founder of Aman Resorts, at state expense on a chopper to show him lands for him to start his investment in Aman Resorts. Victoria Golf Course, I remember carrying a policy paper to Madam Chandrika Kumaratunga. The opening line of the policy paper was, Sri Lanka must be the only country in the world where for 110 years we have not opened a single new golf course. And that's how Victoria Golf Course started. Virtusa. Signed the BOI agreement in 1996, the rest is history. I personally went to Sweden to sign the BOI agreement for IFS software, huge company today. And personally wrote the cabinet paper, got it approved through the cabinet to allow Millennium Information Technology, or MTI, which was subsequently owned by the London Stock Exchange to build a campus in Malabe. Apollo Hospital was stuck for two years. We came up with a mechanism to make sure that that investment went through. And in infrastructure, SAGT, the first ever port terminal PPP in the whole of South Asia. AES Corporation, one of the biggest US companies, invested a hundred, in a 110 megawatt Kalinitisa project. Mitsui Power, KHD of Germany, Shell Terminals, who built a massive gas terminal in Kerala Pitya. Telia invested in Suntel and then subsequently in Mobitel. Transmarco invested in Lanka Bell and NTT bought SLT and Hutchinson also set up a mobile operation. And then in non-export manufacturing, we had Holder Bank coming into cement, Hanjung into steel, and ETA, a large group in the Middle East, in the UAE, investing in Sri Lanka's second flour mill, Serendip flour mill. Now these are high quality, some of which are Fortune 500 company names. Now, how, was this hap how did this happen? There was a plan. Firstly, Let's build industrial zones. We found that many companies were encountering many bottlenecks at the local government level when in the past the whole island was declared as a free trade zone because we found that the environment approval process, land, land process was quite cumbersome. So between 1997 and 2000, we built eight EPEZs, which are listed in red here, almost tripling the amount of industrial land available for investors, export-oriented investors to invest in. In Horana, we came up with a plan where next to the export processing zone, we'll have a power plant. 
and that's how the Aitkenspan power plant was built, where there would be a separate transmission line brought to the Horana EPZ where export-oriented companies would get preferential tariffs. Unfortunately, after my resignation in 2001, that was not implemented. Then, we provided infrastructure support to investors. As I mentioned earlier, Apollo Hospital and several other private hospitals, such as Asiri Surgical, were built and we quadrupled the number of private hospital beds at that time because BOI obtained a budget to provide the infrastructure to the periphery of the site. So the transformer, the sewage connection, the water connection up to the periphery of the site was paid to the line ministries or the local governments by the BOI through a special budget allocated to the BOI. This is what I call plug and play. Same thing happened when we implemented Nivasipura and Millennium City Aturugiriya, which to this date are the largest private housing schemes ever built, comprising more than 3,000 houses. When Virtusa signed their BOI agreement, Mr. Chris Kanagaratna said, Tilan, we don't have a place with high bandwidth. I went to my board and got, I can't remember the exact allocation, and gave a grant to the World Trade Center to lay a fiber optic cable from the top to the bottom of the World Trade Center, and that's why Virtusa started their business at the World Trade Center. We declared the whole of Malabe as an education and IT zone, and today you can see what has happened with, the, uh, with Malabe working together with the UDA. Created SLIIT today with 22,000 students, the largest not-for-profit university in the country, bigger than Morotu, bigger than Colombo campus, accounting for 50% of IT graduates. How did it start? I went to my board and pleaded with the board to allocate 30 million rupees from the promotion budget of the BOI to provide grant funding to start SLIIT. And then township development. We realized that the mature zones, such as Katunayak and Biagama, were bursting at the seams. So we got a budget from the treasury, built soccer fields, playing fields, up, up, upgraded hospitals, water supply schemes. Why? Because in order to create, cater to the migrant workforce that were occupying these areas. So, so that's pretty much the infrastructure action that we took. And what were the ad administrative action that we took in order to create freedom to invest? Amongst the top things that, in my view, allowed me to perform and the team to perform at the BOI was its board. I remember going to the former president six months into my tenure, saying, Madam, I can't work with the current board. She asked me why. I gave some reasons. And, said, and then she said, whom do you want? I said, I cannot run this organization unless the board becomes a policy-making board. I nominated three of the top secretaries at that time, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Industries, Secretary of Public Policy, and the former chairman of Eight Conspense, Michael Mack. The president immediately removed the board I inherited and appointed this board. That's the day I was able to get the support of the treasury. And that has lessons that we can talk about later. And of course, then creating the PPP unit, the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment, through which PPP investments came about. And then that was a time where the Public Enterprise Reform Commission that implemented privatizations was created. We also created what was then called the Private Sector Infrastructure Development Company to which World Bank ADB gave long-term funding in order to support PPP projects with debt financing. SAGT borrowed from it, some of the power projects borrowed from the PSIDC, and that gave an, gave an impetus for the implementation of PPP projects. We attracted private sector professionals into government, created interministerial facilitation committees chaired by myself, to which secretaries to ministries attended. Today, it's a struggle to have a secretary to a ministry to attend, attend, attend a particular meeting. Set up the research department, provided support towards the implementation of the Indolanka Free Trade Agreement. And there was something very important at that time that allowed us to succeed. We were able to market what I call the sanctity of the BOI agreement. It is no longer that sanctimonious, I'm afraid, because at that time, there were no para-tariffs as we have it now, where a major portion of policy making was possible where you could waive, modify, and exempt the application of certain taxes via Schedule B of the BOI law. So even though excise duties and cessors were not part of Schedule B, there was sanctity of 
changes in log embedded in the BUI agreement. And then of course we did a process mapping in terms of how we fast track investments and I must tell you the record of us receiving an application, approving it, signing an agreement, renting an old building at the Katunayaka zone and commencing commercial operation. So from application to commencing commercial operation, we did it in three weeks. Because this was a company that won a tender to manufacture tents for the Saudi Arabian government after a major fire uh, destroyed the tents and dozens of people were killed. So he had very little time to actually manufacture these tents. So during the 95 to 2001 period, 750 new private projects were implemented. I'm not talking of signing agreements under Section 17 of the BUI law. And this was a doubling of the number of projects that were set up during the prior 17 year period. And that, I'm sorry if I'm sounding as if I'm bragging, but I have to give credit to the board, to, 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 to the team. But that's what allowed the team to win for the first time ever to this date international awards where the BUI won the runner-up of the top national investment agency in Asia awarded by Corporate Location Magazine and by the same magazine 21st best websites out of 500 investment promotion agencies and I'm, I'm proud to say that the BUI was the first organization to actually have a website and have online applications in all of government agencies. Now let's look at the last 10 years. There has been a fundamental shift in the FDI mix, where 90% of FDIs reported over the last 10 years have been either debt or retained earnings reinvested. Now, retained earnings being reinvested is not necessarily a bad thing, and I'm not criticizing the definition of FDI. But if you look at the mix in terms of this particular slide, you can see that almost around 60% of all FDI that came into the country were in the non-tradable sector, such as real estate. Only 25% was, or 24% to be exact, was from the tradable manufacturing sector. And in these statistics are both export and non-export oriented uh, activities. So there's, there's no wonder that the export orientation of BUI approved companies, whether it's local or foreign known, deteriorated. In fact, it's important to note that in 2000, when I did an analysis, we found that 55 to 60% of exports from BUI companies arose from companies that had some quantum of foreign direct investment, either on a minority basis or a majority basis. Now, the next part of my presentation about investment incentives. Now, over the last 10 years, we saw the progression of gradually certain statutes being taken out of Schedule B of the BUI law, which made the BUI less BUI agreement less powerful in a way where you didn't, investors did not have the sanctity of future taxes impacting their business after they signed the BUI agreement. And we saw the advent of what is now called the Strategic Development Project Act, which on top of which certain new para tariffs and taxes were introduced. So whilst the BUI was weakened, the SDP Act allowed for the exemption of virtually every tax in the country but it was a non-transparent process of granting investment incentives. Whereas the BUI law clearly spelled out the qualification criteria for you to qualify for an investment, there was actually only one criteria in the SDP Act, that is a minimum investment of so much. And for you to prove some nebulous concept of whether this is a strategic investment or not. Now, I'll actually go to the, this slide first. So you can see, uh, the SDP versus the BUI tax regime, uh, by the way, on the left side, it's supposed to be a tick mark, where virtually every tax under the sun, this is, by the way, 2018 statistics, um, the tax, tax rates might have changed, can be exempted under SDP, but under the BUI regime, it's only one type of tax, which is customs duty. So, let's look at what happened with the SDP Act. So it was introduced as a panacea for attracting investment. 100% of investments over $100 million that commenced after 2009 has been under the SDP Act. Of the 25 or so SDP projects approved or implemented, not even one 
is export-oriented, manufacturing. 75% of SDEP projects are non-tradable and are in real estate. 20%, thankfully, are in export of services, port terminals and the HCL software project. And only two foreign companies that started construction after January 2015 has invested over $100 million in Sri Lanka, Hambantata port and West Container Terminal. I could be wrong in this, but based on my research, it's a rather a sorry statistic at the end of the day. And if you exclude Hambantota as a one-off investment, 84% of FDI reported in 2017 originated from companies signing agreements prior to 2015. Sorry, I didn't have time to update this statistic, but what this says is that we have been primarily counting retained earnings and debt, foreign debt or debt taken by foreign-owned companies as part of our FDI statistics. If you take even 2017, where $2.1 billion of FDI was reported, 80-some percent of that was retained earnings plus foreign debt and only a small component was equity. So that's the reality. Um, now, what are the deterrents? These deterrents remain even today. When you look at the investment criteria, the no-go, no-go, no-go decision is not made because of tax holidays or accelerated depreciation. It is because of para-tariffs and upfront taxes. Now, when we did this statistic, Harsha, you were also part of a committee, we found that on manufacturing, the upfront taxes, before you earn $1 of revenue, is, was on fo at 14%, and on real estate, it was over 20%. So when you factor in these taxes on a real estate project, it had a 7 to 10% impact on project IRR, negative impact. So no wonder people are searching after SDP status. And I'm not singing the praise of SDP status here. Um, and of course, then when you factor in, at that time the income tax rate was 28%, but if you factor in 26% plus a dividend withhold in tax, it is not surprising that these taxes and the arbitrariness of the SDP Act has in fact caused a deterioration in investment. Now, the final part of my presentation is what is the right balance in formulating legislation and investment incentives to facilitate investment. Now the BOI argument would be, and I'm not necessarily agreeing with this fully, is that many a company, sorry these statistics are a bit hard to read but I'll explain it. The BOI has argued in this that out of 1,700 BOI companies that are in operational operations, almost 80% of them are paying taxes at the normal rate. So we give them the incentives, they set up operation, and after a while, they have to pay all of the normal taxes that are applicable in this country. Now, to some extent, I agree with it, but I disagree with the aggressive nature of which tax holidays were granted, particularly for projects where Sri Lanka is giving up something. For example, a port terminal. I saw no justification to give SAGTC, ICT, or whoever a 20-year income tax holiday, especially when you make a 40% profit margin on it. But I was overruled by the Treasury. On top of granting a 20-year tax holiday, SAGT was granted, much to my shock when I read the budget of 1997 or 8, investment relief of one-third of the investment to be set off against the taxes of John Keels. No wonder that the tax to GDP ratio came down from about 18 to 90 percent, 19 percent that prevailed during the period I was chairman of UI in the late 90s, to 11 percent, uh, Harsha, I believe. So, so there are arguments to be made pro and against incentives, but again, the question is what is the right balance? Now, let us look at the IMF diagnostic report on SDP. Now, this is important when we plan for the future. To quote from Para 194, uh, the IMF report says, this is from September 2023, the Department of Fiscal Policy is a focal point in shaping the tax system, guiding the reform of most taxes, except for the special commodity levy, etc. So, so the brain trust for formulating tax policy is the Department of Fiscal Policy. Great. There is no definition on what criteria needs to be satisfied for a project to be of strategic relevance. And 
the Department of Fiscal Policy is not involved in that particular evaluation. Agreed. To quote from Para 201, the SDP Act should be abolished or suspended until the structures and processes are in place to evaluate the effectiveness of offered incentives fully agreed. And it goes on to say that preparing the necessary structures, including data sharing protocol and legal documents and assign authority to the Department of Fiscal Policy will take time. And therefore, no further projects should be approved until then. And in conclusion, the IMF said, abolish or suspend the SDP Act until explicit criteria are established to evaluate all proposals, including the provision of public information on projected benefits and cost, and a transparent process is defined to apply the criteria. So the IMF has not shut the window for incentives. This is very clear language. The IMF is slapping us in the knuckles and saying, be more transparent in the way you formulate investment incentives. Frame regulations so that investment criteria applies equally, whether you are a local investor, a foreign investor, or a Fortune 500 company. Today, under the SDP Act, if I don't like A versus B, I can give more incentives to A and not B. So, so if you really, where do we go from here? I mean, I don't want to read this entire slide, but the poor FDI performance in manufacturing and the tradable sectors are in particular due to not enough trade agreements, line agency approvals, lack of coordination between the BOI, Treasury, etc. Then there are legal and regulatory issues, uh, infrastructure and labor, poor transport and social infrastructure uh, for mobility, um, lack of new industrial zone capacity with the required social infrastructure. Viacama zone does not have that. And for the last 20 years, we have not built a special economic zone with all of the social and industrial infrastructure. And many a study is done are gathering dust there were some fantastic export strategies that were formulated during the Yahapalna government. What's happened to the implementation of these? There was a de-bureaucratization committee set up with top corporate leaders who were involved. Where is the execution? So here are some points for pondering in terms of what do we do about this. Firstly, let's recognize the importance of PPPs as a source of FDI. 40%, 44% to be exact, of FDI that came during the time I was chairman of the BOI was due to PPPs. And today, 75% of developing countries have central PPP units either under the finance ministry or the head of state. We've had a checkered record where PPP units were either under the BOI or under the finance ministry. I resigned as chairman of the PPP agency about two months after the election of President Gotabe Rajapaksa because I was told to do something that I did not agree with the then Secretary of the President, which was conveyed to me by the then Secretary of the Treasury. And then subsequently the PPP agency was shut down. 12 or 14 members of staff who were fully trained received termination notices. Some of them are part of my team now. Um, and we are exporting our PPP knowledge to other countries, Bangladesh and Maldives, and soon Nepal. And more importantly, more tragically, I must say, $28 million of technical assistance donor money allocated to the PPP agency, money lying in bank accounts of Sri Lanka, adequate for a five-year PPP program, went back. And today we are stuck without that technical assistance. And it shows in statistics, we have not added to a new power plant for the last seven or eight years, a major power plant. I mean, there are smaller ones in, in, in hydros and mini hydros being implemented. So we will certainly face bottlenecks in power consumption. Now, sorry, this has got a little lumped here, this slide. Um, what are the suggestions going forward? Introduction of a new PPP law and update PPP guidelines this is being done. Uh, we facilitated the process. I, I have shared draft number 15 of the PPP guidelines that I did but at the time I resigned, which did not get implemented due to bureaucratic bottlenecks. There's a PPP law being drafted today with assistance from a US donor agency. Rethink investment incentives with external specialists and in consultation with the finance ministry and IMF. 
we really need to do this. Introduce interim changes to the BOI law before an overarching new law. Now, I know an overarching new law is being contemplated. I'm of the view, let's tinker with the current law to have some immediate impacts, such as maybe the BOI board to be expanded to seven and have ex officio, at least at a minimum, a secretary of the treasury or a deputy secretary of the treasury within the BOI board along with the secretary industries or the, give the BOI the ability to nominate or co-opt secretaries of line ministries such as environment or minerals so that the board becomes a policy making body and not a, appoint board members at the whim and fancy of the minister in charge. So let's amend the law in terms of tinkering with the, rather than bringing an overarching new law by, by, by amending the current law. Relook at merging provisions of the SDP Act with the BOI law, Schedule B in particular. The BOI law to migrate to a special economic zone law, particularly to declare Hambantota and Trincomalee as uh, special economic zones because of the importance of social infrastructure. Because we cannot rely on, entirely rely on local governments to provide the social infrastructure. And that's one reason why, as I mentioned earlier in Katunayak and Biagama, the BOI got money from the treasury and complemented the work of the local governments in upgrading the roads and the worker housing and, and, and social infrastructure such as playgrounds. Today the Katunayak cricket grounds is, is, a, is, a, is a division one cricket ground which was built by the BOI. Pallakale cricket stadium was donated on my initiative to the cricket board carving out from the Palakale zone after we won the World Cup because the Candy Cricket Stadium was not up to scratch as a test venue. So we played a bit of part in sports as well. Um, and consider through a new SEZ law, new types of special economic zones because yet the local governments and councils do not have the ability and the finances to support uh, large-scale investment, agri-zones, logistics, tourism special economic zones, such to include marinas and cruise terminals. And I must also add that special economic zones as PPP structures won't work unless there's considerable government financial support. We need to look at revamping the port city law. It is discriminatory against local investors. Then there's a need for greater coordination between the BOI, the PPP agency, State Enterprise Reform Unit, Port City Commission, and the Ministry of Finance. There should be board members who are represented, who are common within these uh, organizations because they have to work together and this, these boards must necessarily have both public sector and private sector professionals and, and individuals who, who are qualified. Enhance the infrastructure budgets, whether it's PPP agency or the BOI, for plug and play investments, the type I spoke about earlier. At the moment, when you want a power connection, the CEB charges you very arbitrarily in terms of your, 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 your power connections. These are services that must be provided by the government. And that's one reason why it's okay to charge, charge income taxes uh, from, from, from investors. Forge donor linkages for technical assistance in particular. And that, I must say, was one of the great facilitators to attract talent and capability was the USAID grant that we received in 1996 for PPP um, facilitation. Strengthen, strengthen research and processes to push through to accelerate the ECTA with India and the China, China, FTA with China. I'm also an advocate of introducing anti-corruption provisions in all laws pertaining to investment and digitizing the investment approval process. It was unheard of in the 1990s about bribery impacting FDI. And I'm sorry to say today, it is a problem. Whether it is at the local government level or whether it is at the highest political levels. And finally, this is my final point, make public service attractive again for capable private sector individuals. I'm not saying that the public sector is without the requisite skills. I have learned tremendously from the knowledge of seasoned public sector officials. But often there is a need to attract private sector officials and it's that public-private partnership in people 
that I believe, whether it is in politics or whether it is in public service, that would take this country out of its current morass. And in this regard, I actually sent a policy paper across to the Presidential Secretariat on how we can define a criteria to attract private sector professionals where we would have it formally within the ARs and FRs approved by the Management Services Department and the Cabinet of Ministers, where we would define the re required skills precisely and narrowly so that in a given skill area, you don't attract more than 25 or 30 or 40 people. And, and this I wrote when I was told that Sri Lanka was finding it difficult to attract air traffic controllers to remain in the country because people are migrating or the private sector was taking them on at higher salaries. So therefore, I would advocate that this becomes part of the public sector process where appointments would be based on contract, performance-based contracts. And that's how we hired professionals in the past. One out of five people were fired by me for non-performance. And of course, to seek donor assistance where required. So in conclusion, Moving forward, let us be transparent in FDI procurement. And I believe that the potential to attract FDI in this country is in the billions, whether it is in agribusiness, ICT, tourism, renewable energy. We have 54 gigawatts of offshore wind potential, the World Bank so tells me. The mineral sector, which remains vastly untapped. We still, in 20 years, have not withdrawn the Supreme Court case stopping us exploiting the power of phosphate, and we can become self-sufficient in fertilizer and export fertilizer. But no minister or ministry has taken the matter before a full bench to withdraw what was a ridiculous judgment uh, in terms of uh, moving, moving ahead with uh, the power of phosphate project, titanium, etc. Natural gas, unbundling of the electricity sector creates massive FDI opportunities and investment opportunities. The SOE is being privatized. And very importantly, the recently signed India-Sri Lanka Economic Cooperation Pact, which I see as a huge opportunity for attracting investments from our neighbors and brothers in the north. And for this to happen, the BOI, the SOIRUP, NAPPP agency, the Special Economic Zone Commissions have to work hand in glove and let us hope they would, so that in the short term, Sri Lanka would have some quick wins without having to wait too long. And thank you very much.